to destroy the works. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Matthew 28, 19 through 20. This program is brought to you by the Churches of Christ. We now invite you to open your Bibles and your minds as we present the Gospel of Christ. And now, Ben Bailey. Adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore desires to be a friend of the world has made himself God's enemy. James chapter 4, verse number 4. Welcome to our final lesson in the book of James. Today we're going to look at James chapters 4 and 5 as we think about worldliness, some of its causes, and its cures. What are some of the greatest problems we have in our world today? Well, no doubt atheism is a serious problem today. There's no doubt that agnosticism and all these different ideas are huge problems. Liberalism, big problem today. What's one of the greatest problems we face? Worldliness. Not being attached to this old world is a challenge that every Christian must face on a daily basis. And did you know that James will say most of the problems we have come from desires that are attached to this old world. Why do sometimes Christians have difficulties? Why do Christians fight? Where are there problems sometimes among God's people? desires for pleasures and things of this old world. Look in James chapter 4, beginning in verse number 1. The scripture says, Where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desires for pleasures that war in your members? You lust and do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight and you war. James clearly identifies that part of the problem with fights and disagreements sometimes is out of pleasure because somebody else has this and I may not or, or because I think I need more money or more stuff or more things of this world. Sometimes people find themselves at odds. As Christians we need to abstain from fleshly lust which indeed do war against the soul and sometimes James will go on to teach us the very reason we don't get the things we want is because we don't ask. James says in James chapter 1 verses 2 and 3 or James chapter 4 verses 2 and 3 you do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your pleasures. James mentions that sometimes Christians don't have the things that they think they need. Number one, because they don't ask. If we ask, God promises if we need it, He'll take care of that. John chapter 14, verse number 14, Matthew chapter 11, verse number 24. But then other times... We don't get the things we think we need because we really ask amiss. That is, for the wrong reasons, that we may spend it on our pleasures. And so that's not what life is about. But you know, one of the major problems is mentioned in James 4, verse 4. Adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world, its enmity or division with God, whoever makes himself the friend of the world, has become God's enemy. Worldliness and godliness are at odds. They're diametrically opposed to each other. And here's why. Worldliness draws first place when it shouldn't. Worldliness pulls us away from that close relationship God wants, and worldliness ties us to the temporary, not the eternal. Let me give you a couple examples. Mark chapter 10. Automatically, I think of the rich young ruler. You remember him. He comes to Jesus, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus consequently says, Keep the commandments. Do not murder, do not steal, do not commit adultery. And do you remember what that rich young ruler says? All these things I've done from childhood. One thing you lack. What is it, Lord? Sell what you have. Give to the poor. Come follow me. Do you remember what Mark chapter 10 says? That man went away sorrowful. Why? He had great possessions, worldliness, his heart. Jesus said in Matthew 6, verse 24, where your treasure is, where your heart is, there your treasure be also. That man's treasure was in his possessions and he couldn't give it up. It drew him away 
from really following Jesus. Another example, worldliness often gets the wrong focus in our mind. Luke chapter 12, verses 15 through 21. Rich young ruler, excuse me, the rich fool, had a great crop year, tore down his barns, built bigger barns, said to himself, you've got many goods laid up for many years, eat, drink, and take it easy in essence. Do you remember what God said? You fool. This night will your soul be required of you, then whose things will those be whom you have acquired? And here's the point. So is he who is rich, but not toward God. He was rich in the wrong things. He wasn't rich in godliness. He wasn't rich in following Christ and Christian principles. He was rich from a worldly aspect, but he was broke and poor, dirt poor, spiritually. And when the curtain fell, it was a sad day in that man's life. You know, the great thing is, I don't have to worry about worldliness and things of this life if I'm truly following Christ. For example, Matthew 6.33 tells me, Seek first the kingdom of God. God says this. Here's God's promise. All these things will be provided for you. What things? Food, shelter, and clothing. God's going to take care of me, and He's going to take care of you in this life. We need the attitude of Paul. In Philippians chapter 1, verse 21, Paul said, For to me, to live is Christ, to die is gain. Paul wasn't attached to this old world. It was the last thing he really had his attachment to. He said it so much so that if I die, Hey, that's only a good thing. Don't be unequally yoked together, the Bible says, with unbelievers. Come out from among them. God says in 2 Corinthians 6, verse 17 and 18. And do you remember the words of 1 John 2, verses 15 through 17? Do not love the world or the things that are in the world. For all that is in the world, lust the flesh, lust the eyes, and pride of life, it's not of the Father, but it's of the evil one. And the world and all that's in it is passing away, but... He who does the will of God, that's the one who will live forever. And so don't love the world. Don't get attached to the world. Don't let the world become your main focus because this world is temporary. Now I want you to think about this, friend. Why should you not become attached to the world? This whole world and everything in it is temporary, it's fleeting, and it's only going to be here a little while. 2 Peter 3 verses 9 through 12 says, The earth, the elements, the works, and all that's in it it's one day going to be burned up. If this whole world's going to cease to exist, and that's where my priorities are, one day my priorities are going to cease to exist as well. I need to make sure that my priorities are on spiritual things. This is why Paul would say in Colossians 3 verse 1, If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is. Let's put our focus on the spiritual, on the heavenly, not on this old world and all its entrapments that often bog us down. Lay aside every weight and the sin that does so easily ensnare us and run with endurance the race that is set before us. Hebrews 12, verses 1 and 2. Now, as we think about James chapter 4 and some of the practical messages found therein, let's realize part of the reason that our God warns us about worldliness is because God is a jealous God. Jealous for us in a very good way. Notice James chapter 4, verse number 5. Do you think the Scripture says in vain, the Spirit who dwells in us yearns jealously? You know, one of the things you find in Scripture is that in a good sense, God's jealous for His people. Exodus 20, you find it in Exodus 20, verse 5. God says, I'm a, I'm a jealous God. I want you to only... Put me first and foremost in your life. And so as Christians, we've got to realize that God deeply desires for each one of us to live faithful to Him each and every day and to not let anything get in the way of our serving God. And this is really where humility comes in. I need, how do you, here are some of the causes of worldliness, desire, lust, pleasure. We've got to make sure to realize the warning God gives us. How then do you cure worldliness? Humility. The ability to accept what God teaches and follow that. Look at James chapter 4, verse number 6 and verse number 10. But God gives more grace, therefore he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Now notice verse 10. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. If we humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God, Peter said in 1 Peter 5, verses 5 through 6, He'll exalt us in the last day. Everyone who exalts himself 
he'll be humbled, but he who humbles himself, he'll be exalted. You know, humility is in contrast to pride. Proverbs 16 verse 18 says, Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Pride is the opposite of humility. Humility is the ability to recognize God's God. I'm His creation. Whatever He says, I need to be humble enough to submit to that, to honor that, and to obey God's will. So the key, and one of the keys in overcoming worldliness is to have the humility to submit to what God says about worldliness. But here's the second key. I need to not only have humility, I need to submit to God. I need to do what He says and resist the devil. Look in your Bible in James chapter 4, and I want you to notice what the Scripture says in verse 7. The Bible says, Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Some examples of this are found in Scripture. Matthew chapter 4. Jesus was tempted with a variety of things, including everything you see, Satan said, I'll give you. Jesus said, It is written, it is written, it is written. He didn't give in to the temptation. He knew it was a temptation. He knew it was part of the devil's arsenal. He knew that that could draw him away, and he didn't give in to it. And friend, we need to have the same attitude and mindset. Let's realize the devil is going to do his part to tempt us. Luke chapter 22, verse number 31, Jesus said to Simon, 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 Satan has desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat, but I've prayed for you. We need to be sober. Wake up. Be vigilant. Watch out. The devil walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. You know, the devil has always had that temptation in his arsenal. I'll give you the biggest car. You can have the biggest house. You can have the nicest bank account. All these things I'll give you. Well, what do I got to do? Fall down and worship me? Now, nobody's going to willingly say, well, I'll do that if you give it to me. But friend, when we start putting those things first, when we start letting this old world and its temptations, its attractions, and its lust take precedence over God, let me tell you, the devil's got you right bowed down where he wants you. We've got to make sure that we don't submit to the devil. Rather, we submit to God and resist the devil. That's a true cure for overcoming worldliness. What else must we do to overcome worldliness? One of the great keys is You've got to continually draw closer to God. You've got to work on and grow in one's relationship with God. Look in your Bible in James chapter 4, and I want you to notice what Scripture says in verse number 8. Draw near to God. Notice these words. Draw near to God. He will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. How do you overcome problems. Well, one of the greatest ways is to draw closer to God. Who will ascend to the hill of the Lord? Who may stand in His holy temple? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, the one who draws near to God. We draw near to God in full assurance of faith. Hebrews 10 verse 22 and Hebrews 7 verse 19. We need to make sure that we're striving every day to grow closer to the Lord, to know Him more, to study His Word. Here's the ways you draw near to God. I draw near to God the more I study His Word. This is the Word of God. 2 Timothy 3, verse 16. This is the mind of God and the heart of God revealed in written form. If I want to draw near to God, I've got to know what the mind and the heart of God says. And then I draw near to God as well through prayer. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may find grace and mercy to help in time of need. Men ought always to pray and never lose heart. The Scripture clearly teaches that I can draw closer to God through prayer and through obedience to His almighty will in each and every day of my life. Now, we also must realize that in the final day, it's the Word of God that's going to judge us, and we must submit to that Word. I want you to notice in your Bible, James chapter 4, verse number 12. James says, There is one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy, who are you to judge another? This doesn't mean that we can't make pronouncements of right or wrong, that the Scripture doesn't tell us what's right and what's wrong. Rather, 
it points us to the fact that on that final day, I need to remember God's going to be my judge. Jesus said in John 12, 48, He who rejects me does not receive my word, has that which judges him. The word that I've spoken, it'll judge him in the last day. So then each of us shall give an account of himself to God. Romans 14, verses 10 through 12. We'll give an account of every deed and action that we've done. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 10. And yes, our God is a God of love and mercy, but let's also realize it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Hebrews 10, verse 31. Because our God is a consuming fire. Hebrews 12, verse number 29. And so what should be our attitude and what should be our mindset in this life? The Lord's will needs to come before our own. Let me give you an example of that from the book of James. Look in James chapter 4, verses 13 through 16. James says, Come now you who say, Today or tomorrow we'll go to such and such a city, spend a year there, buy and sell, and make a profit, whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little while, then it vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that. But now you boast in your arrogance, all such boasting is evil. Here's another cure to the problem of worldliness, and it's simply this, that we have the mindset, whatever the will of the Lord is. You've often heard people say, if the Lord wills. That's the attitude. Not something necessarily that you've got a mouth, but it's in your heart, it's in your mind. Is my mindset and is my life lived in view of if the Lord wills. Now you've got an example here. People say, come, we'll go into such such city, we'll buy and sell and make great gain. Wasn't anything of buying or selling or making money. That's not the problem. What's the problem? God wasn't factored in to those plans. Worldliness was likely at the center of those. And so James says, don't say to yourself, we're going to do this. Say, if the Lord wills. Why do we need to say if the Lord wills? Because life's brief and it may not be the Lord's will. James says in James 4, verse 14, What is your life? It's but a vapor. Here for a little while, and then it vanishes away. We don't have promise of tomorrow, and so we need to make sure that we're living and doing what God wants us to do. Now, not only must we do what God says, we must uh, and not break His commandments, but James is going to teach us that when God tells you something, you just can't sit around. That also is a sin. It's the sin of omission. When God tells us to do something and we do the opposite, we have committed sin, we've broken God's law, but when God tells us to do something, we sit there and do nothing. We've omitted God's will in our life and it too is a sin. Let me illustrate. Look in James chapter 4, verse number 17. James says, To him, therefore, to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is a sin. Now, no doubt, in the context, this has to do with the Lord's will. James is trying to get Christians to see. You can't get caught up in the world and not factor in God's will. And if I know to factor in the will of the Lord and I fail to do that, then that's sin. While it's true that such will be the case in that area, no doubt, friend, that applies to multiple areas just as well. If I know as a Christian that I ought to do good unto all men, that ought to help the poor, that ought to encourage those who are sick, that ought to strive to feed the needy and take care of those who are downtrodden. Galatians 6 verse 10, James 1 verse 27. If I know that I ought to do that and I don't do anything, that's a sin. If I know that I ought to spread the gospel and I never say anything about Christ, friend, that's sinful. It's not just breaking the commands of God. It's not just when God says, don't commit adultery, and I commit adultery, but when God tells me to do something, when God says, speak the truth in love, and I don't speak at all. Friend, I've omitted God's will from my life, and I'll give account just as much for that as other things that may occur that I may commit in this life. Then in James chapter 5, James gives us some great lessons to live by that will also help in overcoming worldliness and will create more trust in God Himself. I want you to notice James chapter 5 beginning in verse number 9. How do you overcome problems? 
How do you overcome complaining and grumbling? Look at the example of the prophets. James 5 verses 9 through 11 says this. Do not grumble against one another, brethren, lest you be condemned. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. My brethren, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord as an example of suffering and patience. Indeed, we count them blessed who endure. You have heard of the perseverance of Job and seen the end intended by the Lord, that the Lord is very compassionate and merciful. James here says, don't, don't be a complainer. Don't get grumpy on us. Let's think about this a little bit now. What really do you have to complain about in view of suffering that's occurred among God's people in the past? Think about the prophets, he says. Think about Job. Oh, top example is Job. Job faced so much as a case example that men would serve God for nothing. Job was a man who was upright, blameless, one who feared God and shunned evil. Job 1 verse 4. Satan entered into those plans. Job lost his wealth. He lost his health. He lost his family. Satan's there to tempt him. His wife stays around to curse him, tell him to curse God and die. He gets a dreaded disease. And what did Job say? Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Job 13 verse 15. I know my Redeemer lives, Job said. Job was a great example of one who suffered greatly and trusted in God. Again, think of some of the other prophets. Jeremiah, beaten, put in prison. Ezekiel, laughed at, mocked, taken into captivity. Daniel, thrown in the lion's den. Isaiah, and the troubles that he faced. What about those prophets? They suffered far greater than what we've suffered today, and yet they stand as an example of men who lived apart from the world, who didn't complain and grumble and why me and oh, why is this happening and how bad I've got it. No, these are men who still live life for God and tried to bring others in line with the will of God each and every day. That, that's the idea James is trying to get us at. And then we've got to realize that along the way, we do have hope, we do have help, and we do have things to rejoice about. I want you to direct your attention to James chapter 5, verses 13 through 16. A series of questions and answers now is going to occur that ought to encourage the Christian each and every day. James 5, verse 13 says this, Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing psalms. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church. Let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick. The Lord will raise him up. If he's committed sins, he will be forgiven. Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man overcomes much. Is anybody suffering? Let him pray. Oh, friend, in the midst of suffering, what do I have? have access, direct, direct access to God. Men ought always to pray, Jesus said, and never lose heart, Luke 18, 1. We have communication with the Father in which the Bible tells us we can cast all our cares upon Him. He cares for us, 1 Peter 5, verse 7. What about the opposite extreme? Here's somebody who's suffering. What about somebody who's cheerful? Praise God, he says in essence. Let him sing songs. Bring honor and praise to the name of God if you do have things to rejoice about. Well, what about another question? Is any among you sick? Well, you talk about a question that's relevant today. Sickness and disease is indeed a problem that we face. How do you address that? Let him call for the elders of the church. Anoint, they'll anoint him with oil, praying over him. And the Bible says that the prayer of faith will save him. You know, there are a lot of things going on in that context. And... Some of the things I think were related to maybe the miraculous and some of the things were related to their custom. But here's what I don't want you to miss. Yes, they called for the elders of the church and they prayed for him. There's no doubt that he was anointed with oil in that context, but I don't want you to miss this part. What is it that saved that man? The prayer of faith will save him. Again, we're pointed toward the power of prayer. What, what can we do for someone who's sick and struggling, sick or disease-stricken? We can approach the throne of God for grace and mercy to help 
in time of need. Hebrews chapter 4, verse number 16. And then we have this encouragement in James chapter 5, verse 16. Confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man overcomes much. Look at the power of prayer. I've got to acknowledge sin. I've got to be able to confess that. We need to pray for one another and look at the good that can come. The effective, fervent prayer, the continual, heartfelt, motivated by love for God prayer has the power to change things. Oh, the more in this life that we learn to pray to God, the closer we'll draw to Him and the more we'll be in line with His will. And then, of course, the Christian has the responsibility to restore those who are in error. I want you to notice in your Bible in James chapter 5, verse 19 following. The Scripture says, Brethren, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save a soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. As a child of God, I do want to help others. I, I do want people to go to heaven. If I realize somebody's in sin, if someone wanders from the truth, we've got to steer them back. We've got to help them try to get back in the right way. In so doing, you can save a soul from spiritual death. Friend, today we want you to know that it is your eternal soul that we're concerned about. We're not concerned about your money. We're not concerned about other things that may be related to this old world. We want one thing for you today, and it's this. We want you to spend eternity in heaven with God apart from one day the suffering and troubles of this world. Friend, are you sure you're ready for that day? If not, won't you do that today? Remember, life's but a vapor. Will you hear the word? Romans 10, 17. Would you have the faith to believe in Jesus? John 8, 24. Would you make that great confession? Acts 8, verse 37 through 39. Would you repent of sin in your life? Luke 13, verse 3. And would you, just as the Apostle Paul did, arise, be baptized, wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Remember, James is all about being doers of the Word. Do we have the faith? to take what we've learned and put it to action. If so, those are the people that God is pleased with. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll free at one 855 Four five eight three nine zero five, or write to us at P.O. Box seven eight eight, McMinnville, Tennessee three seven one one one. Gospel of Christ.